And now I would like to introduce you to Carissa Lippo, who is the Director of Professional Education at the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Carissa oversees the center's portfolio of professional education off offerings and has worked with Stanford University for over nine years. Thank you, Sonja. Today I have two esteemed colleagues with me. First is Professor Bill Burnett. He's a consulting faculty member in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and the Design Group here at Stanford University. He's also the Executive Director of the Stanford Design Program. After years of drawing cars and airplanes under his grandmother's sewing machine, Bill went off to the university and discovered, much to his surprise, that there were people in the world who did this kind of thing every day without the sewing machine, and they were called designers. Thirty years, five companies, and a couple of thousand students later, Bill is still drawing and building things, teaching others how to do the same, and quietly enjoying the fact that no one has discovered that he is having too much fun at Stanford. Bill manages the undergraduate and graduate programs in design at Stanford, both joint programs between mechanical engineering and art. In addition to his duties at Stanford, he serves as a board member of D2M, a product design consultancy, Dalton Energy, an alternative energy company focused on developing biomass gasification energy systems for small-scale municipalities, and advises several internet startup companies on design strategy. We also have with us today Fanny Banerjee. He's an associate professor in mechanical engineering and the design group and is director of the Stanford Design Program. Officially trained as an architect, Fanny holds graduate degrees in architecture, mechanical engineering, and design. In his early career in India, he worked in the fields of architecture, structural engineering, and built adobe housing for the rural poor. After coming to the U.S., his interest in the confluence between digital and physical experiences took him to Xerox Park, where he worked on ambient media and physical computing. He also worked for IDEO as a designer and a design strategist, creating novel experiences and crafting futures for high technology companies. He's the founder for the Design for Change Lab, where he addresses the issues of sustainability, technology futures, and the dynamics of rapid change. Currently, he's working with faculty from behavioral sciences, social economics, systems analysis, management science and engineering and art to generate new platforms for design thinking. In addition to his research on technology and design theory, he was a technology artist for the new San Jose International Airport. He is happiest in the presence of sharp minds, sharp cutting tools, wood dust, cutting oil, and the smell of smolder. And with that, I would like to turn the floor over to Professor Bill Burnett. Good morning. Um, thanks for joining us. I think it looks like we have quite a few people in attendance. Again, if you have any questions, please um, uh, join, uh, ask the questions over the, uh, the live chat, and uh, one of us will get um, an answer back to you. So um, Jeff Amelt, the CEO of General Electric, made a pretty important statement a couple of years ago in his uh, annual meeting. He said, the global economic crisis has fundamentally reset the way companies do business and even capitalism itself. Um, at Stanford, we work with lots and lots of uh, uh, industrial affiliates, we call them, companies that come on campus to work with us in the design group um, to learn about uh, our thinking on innovation, our research and how you create um, uh, you know, new strategies for companies. But I think it, uh, the, the emphasis on innovation uh, as a strategic tool and design as the way of creating innovation has really sharpened in the last few years primarily because of the increase in competition and the fact that uh, the big global downturn of 2009, 2008 um, really forced organizations to look for new ways to create organic growth um, through design. And so what, we've, what we find ourselves in the situation, we find ourselves um, okay, uh, coming up with uh, as asking these questions. Excuse me, we were just fiddling with slides here. Um, if you find your, do you find yourself with fewer resources now than ever before? I certainly, I certainly know I do, even at the university here. Um, we're constantly um, uh, downsizing and um, re-resourcing the projects that we're already doing. But at the same time, are you being challenged to implement more projects in spite of the fact that you have fewer resources? Almost all of the companies that we talk to are in this situation. And then globally, are your markets under attack from competitors? Well, either lower cost structures or, or, or even give your product away for free. 
Some of this comes from the globalization uh, of, of the economies around the world, the world becoming flatter and flatter. And some of this comes from, you know, new and innovative companies here in Silicon Valley that uh, change business models um, by um, giving, pro you know, look at, look at Google giving away spreadsheets and word processing and everything else for free simply for the right to um, pop an ad into your browser. So, you know, these are, these are huge shifts in marketplaces which are creating real dilemmas for management teams. And then overall, if you're addressing these kinds of problems through some sort of a strategy of innovation in your organization, are you happy with the process? Are you getting what you think you should get out of innovation and the investment you're making? There are companies that we work with in uh, telecommunications, in the pharmaceutical industries that are spending billions and billions of dollars in their R&D labs. But are they really getting um, uh, the bang for the buck that they're looking for? We really think that the answers to these questions are critical. And if you're like um, most of the senior managers surveyed, half of you are going to say you're really dissatisfied with your return on innovation. The Boston Consulting Group does this um, survey every year of senior managers in the Fortune 1000 companies. And year after year, 54, 55, 56 percent of the senior managers say, I'm making a significant investment in innovation practices in my company, and I really do not understand what the return on that investment is. If you're a manager in an organization and you are trying to manage a process you can neither measure the output from nor understand the process, you're in real trouble. Um, I think that's why in a lot of cases when uh, the economics uh, of a market get difficult, the first thing management teams cut is R&D or innovation or uh, new product development. They can't, they don't understand it. They don't understand how to make it more predictable. predictable and they, they can't um, figure out how to measure it. So the first thing that goes is the thing you can't measure. And we really understand, you know, this, um, this dilemma um, because on the one hand, you have to have innovation. You have to have new product development or new services uh, that, you, that your company uh, brings to the market. You have to respond to competitive threats when your competitors innovate. And at the same time, just throwing money into the black hole of R&D seems like a um, a poor management strategy. So these problems, um, trying to innovate with uncertain boundary conditions, trying to come up with new ideas when you don't know what the competitive landscape is really going to be, essentially the problem of trying to predict the future, um, then the, you know, these problems are classified as wicked problems, problems that are poorly bounded. And some are suggesting that this thing we call design thinking is, is a potential answer to using innovation as a strategic weapon. Harvard Business Review has written about it. Uh, Roger Martin, who's the dean at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto, wrote a great book called The Design of Business, where he talks specifically about using design, design thinking as a methodology of business management. Tim Brown, the CEO of IDEO, uh, uh, one of the you know, top product development and product strategy companies in the world, wrote a book called Change by Design. Um, which talks, you know, uh, because lots and lots of case studies of using design as a strategic weapon in organizations. And Dave Pitnayak, the uh, president of uh, Jump Associates, uh, a sort of a, a design research firm, wrote a book called Wired to Care on the same subject. Uh, Roger, Tim uh, have all spoken here at Stanford. We're uh, very, very much uh, aligned with the research that they're doing. And Dave Pitnayak uh, is one of our um, one of our senior um, uh, lecturers. So these are, you know, these are folks that are, are proposing this methodology as a, as a business strategy rather than simply as a design strategy. And Bruce Nussbaum, the writer, uh, used to be at Business Week, is now a professor at the New School at Pratt, um, has talked about this extensively in the press, this notion of a creative economy. So there are, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of movement in the direction of design thinking. What we're going to try to do today is talk a little bit about what the frameworks of design thinking are and why they might be useful in a strategic uh, role rather than a tactical or just design role. Um, David Kelly, who's one of our senior professors, also the founder of our, our new design institute, the D School, which is our graduate institute where we're teaching design thinking to people from the School of Business, the School of Medicine, the School of Education, lots and lots of different 
uh, touch points around the university. He's also the founder of IDEO. Um, you know, it says that the next generation of innovators and leaders really need to be great design thinkers, and we'd probably argue great design strategists. And one of the frameworks we use is quite simple, and it's this uh, this diagram just below the quote. Um, you know, it's it, it, lots of people have toll gate processes. You do concept first, and then you do development, and then you have you know a big toll gate meeting, and then you have another meeting, another meeting. This this process that we've outlined here, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test. Really, if we were to draw that correctly, that would be a circle of these pentagrams, and the test would lead back to empathize. It's not a toll gate process. It's simply, uh, as Tim Brown describes in his article in the Harvard Business Review, it's a series of spaces you occupy or a series of mindsets that you're mindful of. Empathize is the process of using ethnography and need finding to understand um, the latent needs that your users have. Define is creating a point of view around those needs. Ideate is creating, is generating through brainstorming and other um, uh, ideation and creativity techniques. Many, many, many solutions before you zoom into several that you prototype and test with users, then go back from the knowledge you gain from that to the empathy stage. So, I mean, that's one very simple process diagram. Again, not a toll gate diagram, but more a series of spaces that the team occupies. We use multidisciplinary teams, a radical collaboration in the design thinking process where almost everyone in the organization is involved. So, I mean, I, you know, I, what I'd like to do is um, turn it over to my colleague, Banny Banerjee, for him to talk a, a lot, a little more in depth about a number of these of these steps and the frameworks that we apply to each one. But what I want to leave you with is the notion that when you're dealing with a classical business problem, a problem that you can reduce to alternatives, because you have the data to do so, you can decide whether A is more efficient than B or A is a larger market share than B, and you can make a decision. You can decide your way forward. Also, I mean, we, Banny and I live in the engineering school. When you use, I mean, you have an engineering problem, a problem where you can isolate the variables, reduce the dependent and independent variables to a series of equations, and solve for the correct answer. Then you can, you know, engineer your way forward, or you can, you know, calculate your way forward. And the kinds of problems that we're talking about that is, are best addressed by design thinking, you don't have enough data to decide an A, B decision, and you can't reduce the problem to a well-bounded set of equations. It's a classic wicked problem. So we say you can't think your way forward or decide your way forward. You have to build your way forward. You build through design. Uh, now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Banny Banerjee, and he can talk a little bit about the frameworks we use to decide what do you build. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, what has happened at Stanford over the last uh, 15 or 20 years is uh, in our quarter of Stanford, we've paid a tremendous amount of attention to this whole thing of how do you create transformation through design. And I'm just going to advance the slide. Okay. Um, and, and what we have is, what we've come upon is an entire rubric that we call the Stanford Design Methodology, and it allows us to do a few things. It first of all allows us to look at problem solving in a very, very different way, it, it, in a very creative way, and, and leverages um, the creativity that everybody has, but in, in extremely structured ways. But before we go on to problem solving, because we have, you know, we oh, in in the past so many different fields have come up with very efficient problem solving methods. Uh, the bigger problem is to figure out what the problem is in the first place, the bigger task at hand. And we've beat, uh, our rubric and our methodology really lends itself to a very creative framing of the problem because that is actually the larger part of, of really making a uh, transformation that is meaningful. And, and because a lot of our business systems have relied so heavily on capturing value, it immediately puts us in, in this domain where it's called the red ocean, where all the sharks are, are going after the same food, the water's red with blood, 
and everybody's trying to capture the same value. Our processes, in, in contrast, is very much about value creation. What is, how can one as an organization and as, as individuals within a team direct one's creativity in very, very structured, in, uh, structured ways so as to create value that is very incisive, that is very tightly coupled with an, uh, an understanding of what the need space is. Um, so I'm going to advance the slide and and go on to this. If you if you see the slide, you'll see a, a Venn diagram, and and this explains a very high level view of where we play. This is what this shows is that innovation, as we define it, is is very much at the nexus of business forces and and business uh, viability, uh, technological feasibility. But what is what it is really driven by is a genuine identification of need. Uh, of human need. So a lot of our processes, uh, especially in, in the framework that Bill uh, outlined, you saw that the first stage was actually empathize. And that is something that we time and again in working with industry, we found that, uh, that going in back into the field and really unpacking what the nuances of the needs are is, is actually gives you the seeding function for extremely radical innovations. But it's not just individual needs what is extremely important is to cast itself, cast this innovation in the framework of very large forces, the sociological forces, the cultural forces, and the economic and environmental issues that this issue is cast in. So one looks beyond the, the boundary conditions of one's own domain and, and gets around the risk of, uh, in, that you see a lot, which is organization seeing the world in terms of its own offerings and then all you're, you're locked in to do is make in, uh, incremental changes rather than radical, uh, radical ways of creating new value. So in, you know, if you were to look you know, fast forward and say, okay, so what does design thinking give you at the end of the deal? It gives you, it gives you very, very innovative solutions, and innovation is, is one way of defining innovation is a marked deviation from the norm in terms of in terms of the value one creates. Uh, if, if we were to use the normal processes, you get something on the normative curve, and if you're using innovation, you're using creativity to deviate away from the norm and creating something with disproportionate value. But what you can get at is you can get at completely new experiences that, that the world has not um, uh, uh, yet seen, but which will, the culture will wrap itself around. One can create visions of the future for one's own organization. One can create extremely uh, incisive and, uh, and, and clever strategies and the roadmaps that uh, spill out of that and create an entire strategy for one's innovation. Uh, one can cre use this is to change the organization and the way the organization functions and, and take the organization more towards the path of being innovative. And, and Bill spoke to the sudden need that we have, the, the even greater need that we have in today's world about organizations being much more agile and, and innovative. And that brings us to the need for cognitive shifts. Very often one can be very, very innovative within the framework of what we are doing, but often it, what it takes is a shifting of the framework itself. Uh, one, uh, in terms of the offerings that one is going after, one cannot just look at of uh, uh, an offering as a solution, but as a platform that will create a whole that will serve the larger brand or, or the, it will serve the entire innovation strategy. So, so what is it that it's engendering at the larger scale? That's, those are questions that can be, that can be addressed through design thinking. Uh, what one is also after uh, in, is completely new behaviors in one's market and in, among one's users. If you can uh, come up with, with offerings that cha change behavior, uh, not only have you created value in terms of, uh, in terms of a new behavior that, that people are, are having in order for, for uh, that is better for themselves, you've also made, created market conditions where the behaviors are supporting your offerings. Uh, this whole thing of, of instead of making incremental changes, leapfrogging beyond the current uh, realm and, and anticipating the future and, and getting, getting way past and creating blue ocean strategies 
where one lands in an area where one has created value in such a novel way that for the, for the moment there are no competitors. There is another issue that, that is beginning to surface and in our minds is, is, is going to become a very relevant uh, issue for all organization and that is one of sustainability. So we are paying a lot of attention to how do you build the sustainability into the equation no matter what you do. Um, the other thing that we are very cognizant of, is, and being Stanford, we are you know, at a very high level, we are about creating leaders. We are about, uh, about training people to go out there and make very massive uh, impact. And so we pay a lot of attention to, lead, to, to what constitutes leadership and, and creating the new rules as, as the landscape changes. And what we find is that there is a new form of leadership that is emerging, and that form of leadership actually has, uh, is, is very different and markedly uh, different from, from what leadership used to be in the yesteryears. This is very much about forming, uh, forming visions that are very creative and influencing one's organizations to be very innovative and creating value and creating new markets. That's what leadership is about, and, and that maps very, very well to, to uh, the processes that we are speaking about, and, and, uh, and we speak to a lot of leaders, um, and, and we get this is not just our point of view, but we are triangulating with, with having been, been in conversation with some of the top leaders in the world. So, so how does one go about doing this? It's, you know, and Bill mentioned different classes of challenges and he mentioned a wicked problem. Here is a truth table which is essentially four quadrants and, and it asks a very simple question. Do you know what the outcome you want to have is? And do you know what the process for that is? So there are two questions and just, it's a truth table and depending on whether you know what you, the outcome is and you know what your process is, you land in four different quadrants. Now, if you happen to be in a sector where you know exactly what the outcome is and you also have a process for it, then it falls in the category of a paint-by-numbers kind, of, uh, uh, kind of problem. And that it refers to the paint-by-numbers refers to the children's books where you join the number dots and you just the, the, you just join it to the next dot, and then a picture of a clown or a picture of a lion emerges, and that is, in if you happen to have the privilege of being in an organization which feels safe uh, in operating in that way, every dollar spent on innovation is a waste of that dollar. You do not need innovation in this one. But typically, most organizations, even in extremely stable uh, environments. Uh, uh, can outperform the market and outperform the competition by using uh, innovative techniques, and then it, you're no longer in that that realm. So you could be in in the quest realm where you know what the outcome is, but you have absolutely no idea what the process is. Now that is one where if you don't know what the process is, uh, you could be looking for a long time before you find the outcome. The, the, the process could, could be very elusive. And, and that is, uh, that's a process we call, that's a, a realm of challenges with, that we call the quest. Now, most problems of the type that are emerging, especially at the strategic level, are, happen to fall in, in the fog region where the outcome is unknown and the pro and and the process is also not very clear it's all you know is that there is a large challenge that one needs to get to a solution which is very different from what one is doing there must be a, a really clever uh, approach or a, or an idea or a clever framing out there but it isn't quite clear as to how to get the entire organization of the team or just as an individual how do you get there and that's called a, a fog project and what we do is we don't start off with, with the notion that we know what the outcome is. What we do is turn the fog into a movie kind of a project. A movie project refers to, and the, the way, the reason why it's called a movie uh, uh, project is because the movie industry has a process down to, as to how to make a movie, and sometimes there are as many as 500 and 600 people that get engaged 
in creating a, a two-hour experience, and and there's a lot of money involved in, and a lot of choreography involved. But the movies could be very different from each other. A movie could be a, a, a an action movie or a romance or, or or a thriller or what have you. And and but the process is very very well well understood, and that's how we approach fog problems that are that are wicked problems that are ill-defined problems and what we do is we rely on a process that we rely on to that that un that unpacks the issues and simultaneously frames the problem side as we work on the solution side and as we're working on the solution side it feeds back into un, uh, the redefining the problem side such that the most optimal outcomes and the most robust outcomes emerge out of it in a very, very robust but also very economical way. A lot of these processes have come out of the need to manage resources very tightly while trying to get, get at very disproportionate uh, outcomes, so a lot of our processes speak to that. I think I skipped two slides. Now, this is another view of the sequence that, that Bill mentioned, and it's a, it's a framework. Uh, it, on, on the x-axis, you have time, and you're at, a, at, you, you, at any given time, you have a challenge, and you're going to move in time, and you want a certain kind of out outcome. And, but the, the, the y-axis out here is two realms. One of them is the concrete realm, and the very, very tactile and, and, and understandable realm. And the, the other extent is an abstract realm. In our processes, we find that you ha in, in navigating the process well, it is really important not just to stay in the concrete realm and ma march in time and go from defining a problem and coming up with innovative concepts in, in the future. Uh, what we find is that it's extremely useful to generate uh, the kind of insights that lie in people's lives and in reality and, and in understanding what's happening out there, but go off slowly by these processes of synthesis and frameworking into an abstract realm, and there are all these processes that are linked to it. And what you arrive at is a very defined, crystallized, mile-high view of what's happening, and it allows for the use of very different cognitive processes than are typically at play in, in, in say, engineering. We, the, we use very heavy use. We make very heavy use of, of synthesis, which is a little different from analysis. Analysis is the act of breaking down uh, a problem into smaller and smaller bits and gaining a lot of confidence from having broken it down and gaining a lot of confidence from how defensible that little piece of information is. And synthesis is a little different where you're piecing together uh, different, uh, 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 different components. Each of those components might be extremely innocuous and, and, and simple, but the way you piece it together might, might result in a very magical configuration. And so, th so, so that's a very different kind of cognitive style, and we have processes that, that, that drive that till you get at a very crystallized and very insightful view of what the landscape is and what the framework is. And that allows you to do some abstract operations and make some strategic calls as to what, what is it that you're uh, uh, going to do, what is the space in which you're going to operate, what are the high-level objectives that you want to achieve. And then there you embark on, on a set of processes that get you to a very wide selection of concepts in a very rapid uh, time scale. And what we believe in at Stanford is that the, the act of building is not just an act of, of expressing what you've already thought of, but it's, it's actually a cognitive mode in itself. As you prototype your solution, you come to a much deeper understanding of the integrated space in which one is playing, and it gets to much more uh, much, much more integrated solutions. And then, so then as you come up with concepts, you come back down into the concrete realm, and essentially what one has done is a very tight knitting of the opportunity space and what can be done in reality. 
So, so again, like what the you know just uh, as a strategic tool, design thinking allows a, allows for a very uh, very unique set of outcomes. First of all, it it allows for a very strategic framing of the problem space, a lot of time, or rather a lot of effort and intensity uh, in a in a sh- uh, in a short time frame is dedicated towards framing the problem side really well. It is uh, these processes are are very useful when the the problems are are a huge overlap of very many different uh, domains and functions, and you're trying to satisfy many conditions simultaneously, and also where the nature of the problem is not clear, and there are many feedback loops, and and these design thinking processes are very useful in creating guiding visions, and and in, vi- in visions that are very very easily communicated through the organization and serve as 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 the the guiding star that that all the other actions polarize along and more most importantly it, these processes are very easily uh, uh, learned this is these this it's not rocket science every all of us are, have a lot of latent creativity and these processes are very easily learned and practiced and so it, it, it's easy to embark on a path where the, there's a culture of innovation that, that is brought into an organization, and these processes, when uh, used in combination with other proven uh, techniques that are already in place, uh, just leverages the organization's positioning a, a whole lot. With that, I will pass it on back to Carissa and let her explain the rest. Thank you so much, Fanny. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that at the end of my section, um, we'll be answering some uh, questions for the presenters live, so just uh, feel free to be submitting those while I speak. Um, At the Stanford Center for Professional Development, we're part of the School of Engineering, and we've been delivering education to industry for over 40 years. And so we have reasonable experience in creating educational programs to address the career-long learning needs of professionals, managers, and executives in industry. We at the Stanford Center for Professional Development are pleased to be offering the Innovation Master Series in partnership with faculty like Bill and Banny. For three days, senior faculty will lead you through hands-on workshops where you will experience the problem-solving tools and problem-finding frameworks that lead to innovation and strategic leadership, pioneered by the design group and the D School at Stanford. So here you can see sort of a listing of who we think can benefit from the program. Uh, We designed the program for managers, business leaders, and decision makers faced with the daunting task of retooling and revitalizing their enterprises. So I encourage you to kind of take a look at this and see if you are one of these folks and and are uh, uh, working through some of the challenges that Bill and Vanny mentioned earlier. Uh, We created this program because we've been hearing for quite some time how organizations struggle to make innovation a routine within within their organizations. In today's business environment, companies continue to be challenged to implement more projects with fewer resources. You heard that from Bill earlier today. Here you can see some of the key takeaways that can help you navigate tomorrow's business challenges to impact the long-term success of your company and to create that return on innovation you heard about from Bill. Truly one of the most unique aspects of the program is that you'll get the opportunity opportunity to engage with a who's who lineup of faculty from the Stanford Design Group and the D School who really pioneered design thinking to solve today's wicked problems. Um, And I, you know, one of the things we heard about last year was that the faculty are so engaged in this in this program and and are there throughout, and that's quite quite a unique aspect. Um, uh, You don't typically get that many. you know, famous faculty all in one place at the same time. So now we'd like to take a moment to conduct a poll that we truly appreciate your feedback on. Um, If you could uh, let us know what your level of interest in the Innovation Master Series um, is, uh, the Design Thinking and the Art of Innovation, Uh, we really appreciate your feedback, and we'll leave this open for uh, just a few moments. Okay, thank you so much for your feedback. 
And so now I'd like to mu move on to the uh, question and answer portion of our presentation. A number of great questions came in uh, while I was speaking. And so uh, the first question, um, how does one measure the return on innovation? Um, well, let me, this is Bill Burnett. Let me see if I can take a uh, crack at that. Um, you're obviously going to measure it in the same way you measure other things, although you have to be careful that in, you know, in measuring the phenomenon, you don't kill it. Um, you know, uh, ideas um, need some time. New ideas, innovative ideas often are, look kind of different to the organization. They should. They seem threatening in some cases to the existing business, maybe cannibalizing uh, products or services that you already offer. And so the natural tendency of organizations is to shut down things that are un unusual. Um, so there has to be a part of the process which protects, you know, the early forms of innovation. But our, our, our methodology doesn't rely on having like one big idea and then, you know, and then it works or it doesn't. Our methodology relies on a tight coupling of a prototyping process, which really is a process of asking questions. Uh, it's not a process of building things that you think will work. It's a process of ask, asking questions uh, with users and engaging in, you know, almost a co-creation process. So, one, you have to have a part of the process which is protected from measurement. Uh, because you'll you'll uh, you'll not be able to get enough information to make good choices, uh, and you most likely will damage or kill the most innovative ideas that have the highest potential. They'll be threatening to other parts of the organization. But once you've got you know things kind of out of that incubation stage, you want to measure um, innovation in the same way you measure all other processes. You're looking for um, a return on investment. Highly innovative uh, solutions that have no markets are really of not, not much interest. Highly innovative solutions that address a very niche or narrow market fun function are typically not um, useful as, a, at all. And so, you know, the standard uh, measures of market size, uh, return on uh, invested dollar, and overall kind of looking at the, at the long-term prospects of an innovation, um, all of which are standard business processes. But again, what we're talking about here isn't just hey, I came up with a new coffee cup to replace our old coffee cup. We're talking about coming up with new platforms for innovation. Um, I, I would, uh, I'll give you an example. I was seven years at Apple Computer, not during this period. I was there prior to the um, invention of the iPod. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an overused example, but it's also often misunderstood. When the iPod first came out, when it was first introduced by Steve Jobs, Apple stock dropped for three successive quarters, and the world thought it was a joke. Uh, you don't remember this time, but there was a period of time where people said, you're kidding me, a $300 MP3 player, 300th entry to the market, all the other MP3 players are sub 100 bucks. most of them are you know, sub $50, and Apple, in its arrogance, introduces a $300 hard drive-based MP3 player. Nobody understood it, as, uh, because as a, as a standalone product, it would, in fact, have been a massive failure. What they didn't see was that it was a platform, and they didn't see it until three quarters later, April introduced, you know, the uh, iTunes store and deals with all the five major um, record companies. That's what created the innovation, not the device, not the individual object. It was stepping back and understanding that you had to create a new platform, and you had to create a new behavior, as Vanny spoke about in the past, you had an MP3 player could only hold maybe 50 songs, so you had to pick which 50 songs you wanted to go jogging with or which 50 songs you wanted to take on the airplane, you know, ride to grandma's house. Uh, Apple changed the paradigm. You could now have thousands and thousands of songs. You could have all of your songs uh, on, um, on, your, on your MP3 player. And moreover, you had an ecosystem for refreshing those songs easily, comfortably, legally, it just opened up a whole new possibility uh, that uh, you never had to edit your library. So, you know, in the early days, I'm sure there were people who said, gee, are you sure we should be developing, you know, a $300 hard drive-based MP3 player? This has got nothing to do with what everyone else is doing. Luckily, inside Apple, ideas like that are protected. They're protected particularly because they have strong design leadership from the top. Um, but you, uh, but, but once you had launched the iTunes Store and the whole ecosystem and platform had been revealed, you would measure the strategic advantage of that by looking at how it shifted the conversation from we're an operating system company to we're a media company. 
you would also look at the basic return on investment, the profitability of selling that piece of hardware given the uh, number of downloads per device was extraordinary. And, you know, by any other business metric, you'd consider it a home run. So you can use traditional metrics at the tail end of the process once the product and the platform are launched. But when you're talking about uh, creating innovations with new platforms, you have to incubate, uh, you have to protect the, the babies while they're still kind of growing up. Um, you don't judge them yet until probably they hit you know, their teenage years. Uh, that takes a lot of management uh, focus. It takes a lot of management um, commitment, um, and uh, that's typically uh, led from the top rather than uh, from the bottom. Great. Thank you, Bill. So I think this uh, next question is for Banny. Does the design thinking nexus suggest uh, that the thinkers must come from or be a member in the social, cultural, or economic environment from which the problem arises? Um, so the answer is no. Uh, the processes actually allow you to enter a universe where, which might on day one be completely unknown to you and unfamiliar to you, but, but there's a way in which uh, with fairly economic means uh, and we use, uh, we make very heavy use of, of techniques that we st have stolen from the world of, uh, of cultural anthropology, of going and inquiring in the, in these areas that might be very un very unfamiliar, but coming back with the kind of insights that that uh, will drive will drive the strategies. Um, there's a way in which you you. Uh, go and inquire in a very open-ended manner rather than stepping through through questionnaires. It is, this is you're looking for the driving forces and the underlying forces that are that are causing the causing the the behaviors and latent needs that people are not able to express. But once they see the solution, they'll they'll think that that was, meaning they had wanted that all along, but they don't know how to express it. And the the processes involve triangulating that. So no, you do not need familiarity. Often an innovator and a, and a design thinker is put in a position where they have to go to a country they know nothing about and, and in very little time figure out what is meant, what is a, 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 a really good offering for that, that particular context. Great. Thank you. Um, so we'll take two more questions live, and then the rest of the questions we'll answer at the end of the session. So the next question is, how do you actually teach this to engineers at the skill level and not just at the theor theoretical level? Oh, boy, that's, um, that's a ton of fun, actually, and that's what we spend most of our time doing. You know, the uh, undergraduate program uh, that I'm responsible for is an engineering program. People come in and think they want to be a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer, and then, um, and then they get very excited about design. But as you might imagine, my very, very smart, very, very bright uh, undergraduates here at Stanford didn't get 800s on their creativity SAT because there isn't one. They didn't get 800s on their, um, you know, innovation SAT because there isn't one. But they did probably get 800s on their math. So they're pretty linear thinkers when we start. It's a process first of engaging um, what we call visual thinking because uh, your brain is a massive visual processor and you are aware of, you can verbalize only a very small amount of the information you synthesize. But uh, you, can, you can synthesize information visually. You do it um, very rapidly. So uh, part of the process is just teaching them to reconnect with their visual thinking. Um, we do this through a, a, a great class called the Introduction to Visual Thinking, ME 101. Uh, there's lots of drawing and building and prototyping and visualizing ideas. Once you've got a good path of sort of visualizing ideas, we connect it with this notion of need finding, the empathy side of it. Of the project. If you can generate lots of ideas, but they're not connected to human need, they aren't very useful. So then um, uh, that's an in interesting other challenge to teach engineers, typically less empathic, less uh, social IQ um, sort of folks, uh, how to uh, truly go out and interview in an unbiased way, as Banny was talking about, using the techniques of ethnography, cultural anthropology, to observe with a beginner's mind, to really empathize with people who are struggling to solve a problem, either a, a, a physical problem, a, a technical problem, a social problem, whatever. So we have a, a deep dive class on ethnography and empathy, um, and we and we teach them lots and lots of tools. You know, and, and engineers or anyone likes to have 
you know, when I'm trying to when I'm trying to turn a, a screw, I need a screwdriver. When I'm trying to crank a bolt, I need a wrench. If I pick up the wrong tool, I'm going to get a you know I'm going to get the I'm, I'm going to get a bad result. So we have a series of tools. We have a series of, of, of processes and techniques. Wrap it all in the design thinking methodology. It's actually pretty fun, and even with the graduate students, to sort of watch the transformation. To take an MBA who's very you know very um, structured kind of thinking, very powerful kind of business thinker, which is is wonderful stuff. I and mean, we're not in any way saying that design thinking replaces business thinking or engineering. Uh, processes, not at all. It's just another another powerful tool in your belt, particularly for non non well bounded, non linear, wicked problems. But it's fun to watch an MBA suddenly become creatively confident again. Um, I mean, really, in some ways, I think maybe I'm not teaching people anything they don't know. You were all wildly creative when you were in in kindergarten and first grade, and somewhere along the process, um, our educational system. You know, over-educated your left brain and under-educated your right brain, if you want to put it in a simple terms. And all we're doing is reawakening the connection between the two and, and beefing up that muscle in the right brain of, of you know, visual, um, nonlinear, uh, intuitive, and creative thinking. And it's fun to watch people transform as they go through this, these classes. Great, thank you. So um, our last question that we'll that we'll do live. I know there's a number of additional questions, um, but we'll we'll handle those uh, online once we've completed uh, the webinar today. Um, so does the concept of moving from fog to movie uh, challenge mean that there is a universal process that applies to all innovation challenges? At a high level, going from a fog where where the problem of the challenge is unclear to a point where it does become clear and one can make some strategic calls. Uh, there are there might be very many different processes uh, out there in the world, uh, but uh, but we do have a very very strong process to it, and it lends itself to an enormous diversity of of challenges. You can use that process to to look at. Um, something very technical. It could be how do you deposit uh, a, a micron, uh, a, a microliter or a picoliter vol volume of ink uh, to go through a certain space and, 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 and it's in, in a print technology. Or you can use the same uh, kind of a process with, with you know, in, in the hands of someone who understands the process you also mold the process to the nature of the the problem. The pro, the, it's not a it, it's not a paint by numbers kind of a process, but the same general process would lend itself to a very different kind of challenge. For example, if you were a mining company and you wanted to to not cause civil wars, that's a very different kind of a problem. Uh, but the the same approach would apply. So it, the the process is extremely extremely powerful. And it's also very versatile. Great. Thank you so much. Well, I, I really want to thank our uh, presenters today for um, facilitating a fantastic webinar. Um, I, I'd like to make you aware that this is a part of a three-part series. Um, we have another webinar happening on February 22nd um, and a third on March 30th. Um, related to the Innovation Master Series, so we encourage you to visit our website, scpd.sanford.edu, to check those out. Um, in addition, we have a, a February 16th webinar occurring on a slightly different topic on global product design, similar and related, but not, not exactly a part of this series. So thank you so much, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sonja, who has a few closing announcements. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. There are still a number of questions in the Quay, and we will continue to answer them via IM. We plan to make this presentation available, and we will distribute the PDF of the slides along with the on-demand version in a follow-up email. Thank you again for joining us.